Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our third and final day of the 2014 NHSN training course. Uh, we want to acknowledge again all of you here who have given your undivided attention and great participation, everyone in the room as well as everyone watching the live web stream. Um, we do appreciate your participation. Um, I have multiple um, updates that I'll give throughout the, day, throughout the day, but I have a couple of important things that you'll need to know first thing. Uh, we wanted to remind you that the evaluation forms are in the back, on the back table outside of this room. Uh, I was told that if you are getting CEs, uh, when you apply for that, you'll be able to do the evaluation on the computer so you don't necessarily have to complete it today. But if you aren't going to be applying for CEs, then we ask that you do complete the evaluation form today and leave it um, on the table before you have to go. We really appreciate your feedback and your input, um, and it is important to us. So we do ask that you complete that if you um, are able to give your input. We, in, with regards to feedback and input, we wanted to let you know, we know some of the people in the front have a hard time with the bright lights. We can't, unfortunately, dim the lights any more than we already have because of the live web stream, so we apologize if they're a little bright or hot on, on the tops of your heads. Um, we also know that the round tables haven't been ideal for you in the room. Uh, again, hoping that you've been able to see the presentations with all of the, the drop-down um, slide viewing, but I know it's difficult if you have to have your back or have to turn around to face the front. Just so you know, the reason we chose to do it this way was because we really wanted to maximize the amount of people we could get in the room and get here to this uh, in-person training so that you'd be able to actually be in the room if you wanted to. Um, so many people enroll and register to try to get on the random list that we felt that we should you know, try to do this so we could maximize to the 300 or over but we will evaluate for next year to see if there's any way we can fix that or, or get a bigger room. Let's see, um, I wanted to remind you that the team outside the door is in the back to help you with your transport to the airport. So they can help you with all of that, but they need you to sign up on a sheet and let them know when your flight is uh, so that they can group people together and make sure everybody gets to the airport on time. And if you are leaving early, which we want you to stay today as late as possible to hear all the important information being presented today, but if you do need to leave and you know that it's going to be ahead of schedule, please let them know now um, or as early as possible so that they can make sure to set you up front aside to get you out early for the transportation. Uh, we ask that, um, oh, yes, this is very important. So you have met... Um, many of the individuals who answer the NHSN mailbox for you. Um, there is a group of user support team that you were not able to meet um, because they weren't presenters and they've actually been working behind the scenes to continue to answer the mailbox of questions have come in over the course of this training um, and are always the frontline individuals that help you. So there's a group of those. The individuals, the infection preventionists, a lot of the data analysts, um, data analyst methods and analytics team, you've met here. So now you know that there's not hundreds of people behind the scenes available to answer your questions. Uh, and when we give the training, we always know that there's going to be a hike in the mailbox because of all the important information that was presented. So over the next few weeks, the mailbox is going to double. Um, over the next two weeks, we're actually down one IP um, because she'll be away for two weeks. So we ask that you give us uh, a little bit of leeway and understanding if it takes a little bit longer to answer questions in the next few weeks uh, and, and give us your support with that just to make sure that we catch everybody back up with all the information that's been presented. So we just wanted to bring that to your attention because I know when you ask questions, it's very important and you need those answers because you need to do your job. We do recognize that too, so we will do the best that we can to keep up uh, with the questions that already have begun to come in in these past two days um, from viewers watching live the live, live web streaming. And a reminder for, um, for these presentations, they've all been taped. They will be archived and posted. We expect them to be up by mid to late April. And this way, for your reviewing pleasure, and anyone that you want to pass the information on to, individuals who couldn't come, people who weren't able to get onto the live web streaming, they, can, the, they will be broken up into sections and sessions by topic so that individuals can watch them when it fits into schedules and do it uh, even in a little more piecemeal than, than three days in a row, because I know it's 
that's a lot of information to take in. If there's something you might want to watch again, it'll be available for you to watch. So I think with those, um, I will have uh, Kathy come up and talk about Cowdy, and um, we'll give some more announcements right before lunch. Thank you. Good morning. Well, today we're going to talk about catheter associated UTIs, and um, we're going to try to have a little bit of fun today. So, since you've had two long days, hopefully you'll um, enjoy this this morning's presentation. So, um, I am going to have to cover a little bit of information that I've already covered, as such as HAI definitions, POAs, because we have people tuning in for the um, web streams that may have not listened to the HA the CLABC definition. So. If you want to tune out in those those situations, um, you can, and hopefully you'll tune back in when it's something new for you. But just a little bit of a of a warning. Um, so today we're going to go over the CAUTI uh, definitions and key terms that are utilized in CAUTI surveillance. Uh, we're going to talk about how to collect the urinary catheter and patient day data. We're going to again identify the data collection forms, and then we're going to apply the definitions to some patient case studies. So. Same general over over uh, view that we've done in the past, and um, we're going to cover the epidemiology, uh, the definitions, and the changes for 2014. Talk about denominator collection, and I'll provide you some resources with we'll case studies. And then, lastly, I do want to give you some an update on you know, what's going on with the CAUTI definitions. You probably have heard that we are reviewing those definitions. We've actually been reviewing them since the end of 2012. <laughs> and um, hope to have some changes for 2015. I might not be able to give you a lot of specifics because I've learned that don't give specifics till it's actually totally done because sure is, you know what, it's going to change. Um, so, uh, but I can tell you what, you know, what is being done and, and then for those of you that are coming to APIC, I'll also be doing a presentation there and maybe I'll be able to give a little bit more details at that time. So, so again, we're not going to go over in depth today um, requirements for Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, inpatient quality reporting program or the um, oncology, the cancer exempt hospitals reporting. All that information is available on our website um, or through the QIOs, and I've provided you those resources here. Um, also, we will not be going through step-by-step -step data entry, um, and Maggie's been covering all of the data analysis for us um, very well, so I don't have to do that. So CAUTI, who cares about CAUTIs, right? Who cares? Um, urinary tract infection uh, is tied, believe it or not, you probably know this, with pneumonia as the second most common type of healthcare associated infection, but, um, and it's really only second to SSIs in overall incidence. And we know that the majority of them are associated with uh, indwelling catheters. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, five, a little over 5% of uh, of um, I, uh, ICU cauties uh, result in bloodstream infections, and in non-ICU cauties, that is up to about 7.4. So interestingly enough, um, higher secondary BSI right in, outside of the ICU. Um, 13,000 people die every year for UTI, so you know it, it does cause some morbidity and mortality. And Interestingly, um, up to a third of asymptomatic bacteriuria is treated with antimicrobials, and even though this is you know, in conflict with published guidelines and results in a lot of um, unnecessary antibiotic usage, C. difficile infections, adverse reactions. Um, and so uh, that's you know, one of the main reasons that ASB was removed um, back in 2009 from our criteria. So um, it's important for us to shine a light sort of on CAUTI and what we can do to prevent that and how we can treat it and identify it correctly. And um, a lot of people are saying now that you know, CAUTI is maybe a proxy measure for the overall general quality of care for patients. So, um, you know, that's another reason that we might be concerned about what happens in this area. So again, we just want to make sure that all of our data that we enter is, um, is good data. And um, so things to consider for CAUTI surveillance. So nice thing is that 
unlike SSI um, surveillance, all CAUTIs are going to require a positive urine culture. So you can start with your laboratory um, as your basis for case finding. Uh, so hopefully you all are all able to get a routinely re uh, generated report of your positive urine cultures, and um, that's your starting point. But I do want to point out that it's really important for you to know your laboratory's urine culture reporting policies. Um, specific, specifically, what are the ranges of, of, of colony forming units that they're reporting? Some facilities don't report down to uh, 10 to the third, which is you know the part is part of the definition for UTIs. Uh, some of them don't quantify yeasts, and so the facility is not able to meet all the criteria as they're currently written for, since we include yeast as a pathogen for CAUTIs at this time. Um, Sometimes uh, positive urine cultures are reported for the unit on which they were collected and not necessarily on the unit that the patient is on. So you may need to check to make sure that uh, you're attributing that CAUTI to the right location. Um, that seems to happen a lot with patients that are discharged. Um, sometimes the, the discharge location or the um, location for the culture is, is not accurate. So just you need to consider the transfer rules and how the laboratory report might be affecting that. And um, finally, you know, just to take into account that you need to account for positive cultures from the emergency department because those could really represent caudies from patients that had recently been discharged and might be, should be attributed to that discharging location. So again, what are you going to look at first, and where is it going to be in the record? Those are you know, things that you need to think about. You're going to be looking for your um, urine culture results and your laboratory results. Um, and then probably what you want to look for, look for unless you're in Pennsylvania, um, most, <laughs> most uh, facilities, not a lot of facilities are doing surveillance for non-catheter-associated UTIs. So you know, you're going to look, maybe, maybe the next thing you look at is whether or not they had a urinary catheter in place in the time period. You know, and you're going to be looking for nursing documentation and, and graphic sheets for the, those types of information. This is a sample worksheet that, um, you know, that we put out for your use for data collection. You guys, some facilities create their own data collection sheet, which is fine, just as long as it collects all of the information you need for NHSN. But um, this one is available on the website for your use. And then, you know, the old spiel about making sure that we're all doing things the same way. I went over this pretty well, well with CLABSI. You know, we need to all be consistently applying the definitions. Um, standardizing your chart review will help you to be consistent over time. So if you get into a routine of how you collect data and how you identify cases, um, that will really help. Maintain the focus on the criteria um, and don't deviate from that. Uh, CAUTI is one of those areas sometimes where people feel that um, maybe they're not capturing all of the patients that they clinically believe have a UTI. Uh, we hear this a lot with patients that are on ventilators um, or sp spinal cord injury patients, maybe because you know, they're not able to communicate for whatever reason uh, suprapubic tenderness or um, CVA pain. Uh, surprisingly though, um, honestly only well, 80% of our patients that are reported as CAUTIs have fever as their only symptom. That may be surprising to you, it may, may not be. So um, if you think about it that way, the spinal cord injury patients or the ventilated patients are maybe not that different. I mean, most people, most patients, when we identify it, it's, it's through the use of a fever. Um, you know, the other thing to think about with that, I always tell people, is that just because a patient is ventilated doesn't mean they can't communicate pain. Uh, especially with these, sed seda these sedation vacations, um, and uh, depending on the level of sedation, patients can exhibit signs in, of pain if their assessment, physical assessments are done. So um, I don't, I always hate for people to just say, well, they're on a ventilator, we can't tell whether or not they have any suprapubic pain, because that's not always the case. Um, so again, uh, Think about surveillance definitions versus clinical definitions and the fact that sometimes the two are not going to meet. Um, you know, we're looking, we're using the definitions for surveillance different than the clinicians are using uh, to make determinations about what's going on with the patient, what 
uh, and what they should do. And our data elements are going to be limited, they're going to be finite, and um, the clinicians are able to use everything that's available to them. So um, it's okay if they don't always match. We obviously try to make our criteria so that they are as close to clinical definitions as possible, but we have a long way to go, especially in CAUTI, I know. Um, but we're work we are definitely working on that um, now. Was that a laugh? <laughs> uh, so sometimes, you know, sometimes it's helpful to remind your staff about uh, surveillance or to educate staff about surveillance and clinical definitions. Um, how many people here have had to have this conversation in their department? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And surprisingly, sometimes it's infectious disease physicians that you have to have that conversation with, which is always surprising to me because... Uh, I would have thought they'd understood that, but um, uh, we always want to make sure, obviously, that we're using the surveillance definitions as, as the determinant of what we report. And we're always here at NHSN at CDC.gov, as um, Dawn told you, uh, to receive your questions and try to help you out. Oh, so I want to make a disclaimer. I thought it would be fun if I shared some of the funny emails that we get from users, because we get some. Um, I didn't include any identifiers on these, so if it's from you and you recognize it, don't tell anybody. <laughs> they will not know. So I'm going to share, as we go along today, I'm going to share a couple of funny emails that, that we've gotten. So here's one that I got from a user. So I am looking at a patient that presented to our facility on 2-15-13. A Foley was placed in the ER on the admission date. During her stay, she was afebrile and symptom-free, with one exception. A temp of 102 was documented on midnight. The nurse manager feels that this is possibly a misdocumentation and would like some guidance. Do we still call this a CAUTI? No, you can just discount that. Don't worry about it. It's probably a, mis it's probably a mistake. Yes, you have to still call us county. All right, so we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of the surveillance of the definitions, and um, we're not really going to be talking about non-catheter-associated UTIs here today. Um, as you may or may not know, they have their own criteria designated as the B criteria for SUDI. The A criteria are all catheter-associated. The B criteria are all non-catheter-associated. And I want to identify that booties can also be non-catheter associated, or they can be catheter associated. And um, if you are determining whether or not an LCBI, uh, BSI is secondary to a non-catheter associated UTI, you have to make sure that you use the non-catheter associated definitions. And, and you'll see as we go along, if you don't already know, why that's important. So. There are basically two specific types of UTI, a symptomatic UTI or SUDI, or an asymptomatic bacteremic UTI or a booty, as we like to refer to it. Um, I do want to point out, sometimes people are confused between asymptomatic bacteremic UTI and asymptomatic bacteriuria, or ASB, which we used to have in 2009. Asymptomatic bacteriuria just means that there is um, there are organisms in the urine, but um, an asymptomatic bacteremic UTI is one where there's not only organisms in the urine, but there's also a matching organism in the bloodstream. So the patient has a, sec has a bloodstream infection as a result, or in, in, in concurrently with the UTI. So that is, that is the difference. They're not the same animal, and um, it's important that you understand that. Both types of infections, both SUDIs and abutis, if they're catheter-associated, need to be reported as part of any CMS, CAUTI, surveillance that you're doing. That's another thing that sometimes people don't quite understand. You can't just report the SUDIs, you also have to report the abutis. So, um, you know, as, over the years as I've presented this information, I've presented it in different ways, and sometimes it's hard for people to understand the logic of why the definitions are the, as they are. Sometimes they seem like they're really complicated, so I've tried to present it in different ways, and this time I thought I'd tell you, just present the logic behind the SUDI definitions. And um, one, of the, one of the important points is that the symptoms of a true UTI are going to vary whether or not the patient has a Foley in place. If a, a patient has a catheter in place, they're going to have 
urgency sometimes. You know, I mean, how many people have had a patient and they said, I've got to go to the bathroom? And you say, um, you've, got, you've got a catheter in, you just relax, you know, you can go. So that foreign body causes urgency. Um, it can cause burning, a burning sensation sometimes. You shouldn't be having frequency, but... So we took those out of patients. That, you know, they used to be in the criteria for, for patients that had Foley's, and it did, they didn't make any sense to be in there. So that's why we've taken them out of the criteria for patients that are currently catheterized. Um, infants, we know, exhibit different symptomatology as well for infections, and that's why we provide some infant-specific criteria. And those additional ones are apnea, bradycardia, lethargy, vomiting, or hypothermia, because you know patients can have instability in temps when they have an infection. So um, these are the, sort of the two big concepts of why we have some, compli some complexity to our UTI criteria. So this is sort of an overview of UTIs, um, the UTI definition. So you can see that I've divided these by age groups. Uh, SUDI 1 and SUDI 2 are for patients of any age. SUDI 3 and SUDI 4 are for infants. And then we have our abutis, which again are for patients of any age. Now, I told you yesterday that infants not only can meet these, but they can meet any of, the, any of these. Um, it's just the, uh, the patients that are over a one year of age that cannot meet three or four, okay? Within each of these different types of UTIs, we have catheter-associated or non-catheter-associated UTIs. Okay. Make sense? All right, so now we're going to look at how the uh, colony-forming units are applied to these. So for SUDI 1 and SUDI 3, we're dealing with patients that have at least 100,000 colony-forming units. And I have an asterisk here. You'll notice that it, it goes down to they have to have no more than two organisms in that urine culture. And that's because we want to make sure that this is not a contaminated urine culture. If there's three or more organisms, the chances are pretty high that that's been just a poorly collected culture. We don't want to use it to say that somebody has a UTI. We don't want to overcall these UTIs. A booty also requires greater than 100,000. You'll never have an a booty that has less than 100,000. Um, and that's, that's for a reason. You know, we... This patient is asymptomatic, so we want to have a high degree of, as high a degree as we can of confidence that this is truly a UTI, and so that's why we're going to require a high colony forming unit count. You'll notice though there's two stars there, and that means that um, not, we don't use organisms, we use uropathogens. So there cannot be more than two uropathogens, and we provide you a list of what those uropathogens are. Pathogens are. It's a pretty broad list. Um, but there are a few organisms that um, are not on that list. That list is um, included in the NHS in the NHSN CAUTI protocol. I'm trying to remember if it's, I think we have it on our organism list too that's on the website where we have MBI and we have um, common commensals. People are nodding, so. Um, so that leaves SUDI2 and SUDI4. So you'll notice that one of the infants, the SUDI3, has 100,000 or more. One of the infants has greater than 1,000 or less than 100,000. So we have adult and child, adult and child. Or I say adult, any age and child, any age and child. Um, so this, this group here, SUDI2 and 4, have a lower colony forming count, 1,000 or more, but less than 100,000. Again no more than two organisms in the culture. Because this is a smaller colony forming count, we're gonna require some symptoms, um, uh, I'm sorry, some uh, a supportive positive UA uh, to give more credence to the fact or, or that this is truly um, a, a good culture and, and indicative of an infection. So that's why this criteria requires this lower level colony count and a supportive positive UA. Again, within a time period of no more than a single gap day between adjacent elements. Okay. Is this a good way to present this? Does this make sense? Yeah. Okay, good, thank you for the feedback. Okay, so um, 
when we're looking at the symptoms, the really the main question that you have to ask yourself, and I, I went over this a little bit, was, was the catheter in place at the date of the event? If the answer is yes, then you're going to have a limited number of symptoms that you can use. You can only use suprapubic tenderness, costovertebral angle pain or tenderness, or fever greater than 38 degrees Celsius. If it's a baby, you can additionally use hypothermia, less than 36, apnea, bradycardia, lethargy, or vomiting. Okay. You'll notice what we've taken out of there um, when you look at the nose. So there was no catheter in place on the date of the event. You'll see here I've bolded. You now have dysteria, frequency, or urgency that you can utilize. And then you have all that you had for, this, for the um, yes answer. You have your suprapubic tenderness, CVA, pain or tenderness, fever, and then the infant criteria. So we simply remove these three, dysteria, frequency, or urgency, if the catheter is in place. Um, as I said, um, when there's more than two species of microorganisms, that's routinely regarded as a contaminated culture, and we don't want to use it for NHSN. We do get questions about reports, culture reports that um, come back as mixed flora. And um, generally, mixed flora represents more than two organisms, two species. So if you have mixed flora and you have any additional organism recovered from the same culture, that's going to have more than two organisms. So um, for example, if you have a report that maybe there's greater than 100,000 Pseudomonas aeruginosa and there's mixed flora. Um, clinically, we probably would believe that greater than 100,000. But unfortunately, we have mixed flora in there, so we can't utilize that. Um, this is one of the issues that we're kind of talking about with the new definitions also. You know, can we say if there's a preponderant organism, can we say that that should be utilized? As it stands right now, in that situation, you would not use that culture report. If the organisms are the same genus but two different species, um, they're considered two different organisms. So if you had a Pseudomonas and aeruginosa, aeruginosa and a Pseudomonas seri, um, that's two organisms. If you add anything onto that, um, you're not going to be able to use the, the culture. And um, kind of the flip side of that, if you have an anti, if you have an organism that has just simply the same organism but has different susceptibility patterns, such as MRSA or MSSA, those are considered just one organism. Because you know we know that how the laboratory works those up, they they may just pick different um, colonies from you know that cultures or colonies that represent the same organisms, and um, there is some variation and resistance within those. So we don't want to say that those are different organisms altogether. So those would be considered just one organism. OK. Um, sometimes, obviously, patients will um, have a positive urine culture, <coughs> excuse me, um, shortly after their catheter is removed. So for those patients, um, if the event date, the UTI date, is on the day of device discontinuation or the following calendar day, just like for CLABSIs, these are going to be considered device associated, as long as the device had already been in for greater than two days. Um, and for this criteria, you are able to utilize urgency, frequency, and dysuria, because the catheter has been taken out. So I've given you two examples. Um, first one, the Foley is placed. Um, and uh, it's there, placed on day one. Day two, it's still there. Day three, it's in place for part of the day and then um, only, only for part of the day. And then it's removed. The next day, the patient meets UTI criteria. This is going to be considered a caudy. Unlike um, here, where the Foley is placed on day one, uh, it's taken out on day two. It was there for part of the day, taken out. The next day, they have no Foley, and they meet criteria on day four. That is going to be a healthcare-associated UTI, but it's not going to be considered a catheter-associated UTI. Whether or not we, whether or not you clinically believe or agree with that or not, it's going to be the, the, that's the definitional interpretation. So let's just uh, go over the criteria um, as a whole here. So these are the A criteria for SUTI, symptomatic UTIs. A meaning that there is, these are going to be catheter associated. On the first, you'll see there's a, it's split. The first 
half of this is for patients that have the catheter in place on the day of event. The second half are for those that had it in for greater than two days, but had it removed the day of or the day before the event, okay? So for the first ones, it's in place, it's been in place for greater than two days on the day of event. They can have fever, suprapubic tenderness, CVA pain, angle pain or tenderness, and they have to have a positive urine culture of greater than 10 to the fifth, and no more than two species of microorganisms. And again, the gap, gap day for, um, single gap day does apply. If the catheter had been in place for greater than two days and it was removed the day of or the day before the event, then we add in the serious, urgency, frequency, and then again, fever, CVA, suprapubic SP, tenderness, and the same requirements for the positive urine culture of greater than or equal to 10 to the fifth and no more than two microorganisms. Now, you'll notice that there is an asterisk here for with no other recognized cause. And for those astute clinicians, you'll notice that it's not there for fever. And this is um, one of the questions that we get the most and one that's, you know, we are discussing how best to approach this. The reason it's not there is because to allow, um, and, and this happens more with CAUTI than it does with CLABSI because, you know, with CLABSI, you don't, with CLABSI 1, you don't have to have any symptoms. Um, but you know, if the patient has a pneumonia and they have a positive urine culture because they've pan-cultured the patient, um, if the fever is there, the fever has to be utilized to meet the UTI criteria. If you're doing pneumonia, pneumonia surveillance, you'll also have to use it for the pneumonia criteria. And that's because um, at this point, we haven't figured out a good way to, I, to um, operationalize clinical judgment about where that UTI goes, or where that fever is, is responsible for. And it may be responsible, it may be due to both infections. If the patient has both infections, they may be running a fever because of both. I mean, the body doesn't, I don't, does the body differentiate? I don't know. Um, so uh, the only way I think that we could get around this would be if we were to identify a um, hierarchy of infections Okay, if they have this, if they have this infection and this infection, you apply the fever to this infection. Um, but you see that quickly becomes very complex. And so that's what we're wrestling with. So for now, um, the fever is a nonspecific symptom and you have to apply it to all potential infection types. Criterion two, again, this is an A, so these are our catheter-associated infections you'll see. Two, again, is for those patients that have um, less than 100,000, um, but greater than 1,000. If the catheter's in place, the symptoms are exactly the same as they were for A. We're gonna have those symptoms minus dysuria, frequency, and urgency. Additionally, however, you're gonna have to have a positive UA. And by positive, uh, we mean a dipstick that's positive for leukocyte esterase or nitrite or pyuria. Uh, that means greater than or equal to 10 WBCs of unspun urine. How many of you know whether or not your lab spins your urine? Okay, how many of you don't know? Yeah, so you need to, you need to see if it's being reported out to you or if not, you need to clarify that with your, with your laboratory because if it's spun urine, it's greater than or equal to 10. If it's unspun urine, um, they're gonna be looking at it under a high power field and it's greater than five WBCs to be positive, okay? And you could also meet this using a gram stain if there's microorganisms seen on unspun urine. Not many laboratories do this anymore. Uh, questions that we do get sometimes is what is trace? Is trace positive? Yeah, trace is positive. So if you have a trace leukocyte trace, it's positive. Just like with 1A, you know, we have this top portion that was in place. We have the bottom portion that is out. The catheter was taken out the day of or the day before. That means that we've um, added back in urgency, frequency, or dysuria. Just as above, this is the ones that have 
greater than 1,000 or equal to or greater than 1,000 but less than 100,000. And they have to have one of the same um, positive UAs. Uh, so the only difference between the top and the bottom is uh, the additional uh, criteria of urgency, frequency, and dysuria if the catheter had just been removed. Clear? Yeah, looks like everybody's with me, yay. So I'm not gonna go over this diagram, I just wanna point out that it is, in the, it is in the protocol. Some people are very, you know, they do much better with a flow chart than they do all of the text, so we do have it there. One is for, this one it happens to be if the Foley is in place. We have one if the Foley is removed. There are similar flow charts for three and four. Um, and for a booty. Now the criteria for the infants, uh, one year of age or less, is um, <clears throat> very similar. You'll notice that three is very similar to one in that the criteria, the colony forming units is greater than or equal to 100,000. Um, the only difference between the adults or the all age criteria in one and the three is that we've added again hypothermia, apnea, bradycardia, uh, lethargy, and vomiting. <clears throat> Other than that, it's exactly the same. The one difference that I'm going to say is that you'll notice we have two asterisks down here. Rather than splitting this up, we have simply said between those patients that had the catheter or those that had it removed. Um, we've just asterisk down here that if they had the catheter in place for greater than two calendar days with the day of device placement being done and the catheter was in place on the date of event, um, that, uh, that they can uh, utilize these symptoms here. Four, uh, four is very similar to two. It's the analogy of two in that the, cath the colony forming count is lower. It's greater than 1,000, less than 100,000. Because of that, you need, a re, you need a positive UA. The positive UA results are no different for children than, than they are for adults. And um, again, those additional uh, symptoms that I, that I mentioned above. <clears throat> so um, this, this, just to point out that this um, double asterisk is how you're going to determine whether or not this is a catheter-associated device or, or UTI or not. Asymptomatic bacteremic UTI. <clears throat> this, um, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background for those of you that don't know um, how this definition came about. Um, back in 2009, when we removed ASB, asymptomatic bacteria, um, we didn't anticipate a problem that would occur from that, um, and that was that if, if a patient had a positive urine culture, um, but they didn't have any symptoms, it could no longer be called an ASB. It used to be that that could be reported as an ASB. If it was recorded as an ASB, then it could be said that an LCBI that occurred at the same time with a matching organism was secondary to that. Well, when we took away ASB, we now had these positive blood cultures that matched a urine culture, but they couldn't be called secondary. And so if the central line was in place, they became clapses. And that didn't sit well with people, it didn't sit well with us. So um, we uh, developed asymptomatic bacteremic UTI. So this is for a patient that has a urinary catheter in place or doesn't have one, that could be catheter associated or not, or not. and any age patient, so we don't have an infant one. Um, they can have none of the symptoms that we've mentioned for any of the other criteria. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go through all those. They simply can't have any of the earlier UTI symptoms. Additionally, they have to have a positive urine culture of greater than 10 to the fifth. Again, no more than two species, and a list of specific uropathogens that have to be involved. And we'll go over those in just a second. That there has to be an accompanying matching blood culture with at least one organism to the urine culture. If all of that occurs within um, a time frame that doesn't exceed a gap of one calendar day between two adjacent elements, then this isn't a booty, and you would not call a primary BSI. Okay. 
That list of uropathogens are um, listed here. As I told you, it's pretty broad. Gram-negative bacilli, staph species, yeast, beta hemolytic strep, enterococcus, Gardnerella vaginalis. We took these lists from, um, a, 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 I can't remember the source, but this is, we didn't make this list up. <laughs> I can get you the list at the source if you want it. Uh, Aerococcus urinae and Carini bacterium. Um, you know, it's very seldom that I hear of, of, of an organism that doesn't fit in here. So, and there, that complete list is, um, you know, listing out the, the species as well as the um, genus is on our website. Okay. So, um, just to Say again, only the events for a booty that had catheters in place for greater than two calendar days prior to the date of onset are catheter associated. Otherwise, um, they are none. And then um, UTIs is one of them that we get a lot of questions about the recurrence. Is it new or is it is it a recurrence? Do we have to report a whole separate UTI? And the Guidance here is no different than it was for LCBI. We say, look to see what evidence of infection is, is still occurring. Does it appear that the infection has resolved clinically? Or are they still being treated for the first UTI? Um, if either of those is yes, then we would not assign a new UTI. We would say it's a continuation. And that is irrespective of whether or not it's the same organism. So. I always use yeast as an example because it happens so often. Somebody's being treated for E. coli UTI, and four days later they have a positive urine culture for yeast. Um, they're probably still being treated at four days. Um, and in that case, if, if they are, then you're, that, you're just going to add that yeast onto, if you've reported the UTI, you're going to add that yeast on as a pathogen for that, rather than calling a separate infection. OK, you ready for another email? They get funnier as we go along. So um, this is what we got. Good afternoon. I have a patient who met all the criteria for Caudia on 121 when she spiked a fever. However, she was declared brain dead on 118 and was only being kept around so her organs could be harvested. Would she be considered a Caudia? I thought, that's a really strange way to, place, to, to phrase that. She was only being kept around so her organs could be harvested. Um, the answer is yes, we do include patients that are, uh, are in, play, in hospital, you know, they're um, organ donation patients, um, because we shouldn't be giving them UTIs, even though, you know, they're here for organ donation. So, um, and we actually have reviewed that decision with our patient, uh, our organ transplant team, and um, they were in agreement with it. So, yes. That got people talking. <laughs> okay, now we're going to go on to key terms. So, Obviously, all caudies have to be in HAI. So we're going to talk about POA versus HAI. Here's where you might want to tune out if you've heard this all more than you want to. Um, a POA infection is one that uh, all criteria, all criteria are present during the two calendar days before the day of admission, the first day of admission, and or the day after admission, um, and um, are documented in the medical record. If it's POA, you shouldn't be reporting it to NHSN. We are only interested in healthcare-associated infections. And um, acceptable documentation, again, does not include that reported by the patient. If the patient says, I was febrile, you can't utilize that. <clears throat> you can if um, a report comes from the other hospital that the patient's febrile. And something I didn't mention is that we really you know, we were trying to balance what we required from you to know and whatnot. We didn't want you to have to go back and ask the facility, what the fever was. So as long as it's documented that the patient was febrile, you can use that to meet uh, that part of the criteria. Physician diagnosis is not a part of the CAUTI definition. So a patient coming in and the physician says he has a UTI, that can't, is not sufficient to say that the patient had a UTI on admission. 
Okay, the patient is going to have to meet the criteria during that time period. So here's the unlucky family again. <clears throat> Grandpa Unlucky has been in an inpatient rehab facility following multiple fractures sustained in a multi-car pileup when Atlanta sustained the Snowmageddon of 2014, <laughs> otherwise known as a half an inch of snow. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he's now transferred, he's also transferred by the way, to your hospital with a Foley catheter which has been in place for two weeks and reported by healthcare worker of fever the day before transfer and a change in mental status. He's a febrile in admission and his urine cultures are collected on admission are positive for greater than 100,000 CFUs of E. coli. So we're gonna, we're gonna vote again this morning. Which of the following is most accurate? He does not have a UTI has a UTI attributed to the new hospital, or he has a UTI attributable to the rehab facility and is POA to the hospital. Okay, let's see how you've done. A couple more seconds. So 96% of you think that the patient has a UTI attributable to the rehab facility and POA to the hospital, and that is the correct answer. And let's see why. So um, he... On the date that he's admitted to your hospital, there was a report of fever the day before transfer, which was reported by a healthcare professional, and he had a urine culture collected, which was greater than 100,000 of E. coli. So he meets SUDI 1A, present on admission. Actually, attributable to, to the other hospital, and if we do encourage you to to communicate with other facilities to let them know when you identify an infection that um, is attributable to them. And, and if I was you, I certainly would, because I don't want to be compared to somebody that's not collecting all of their data. So. Definition of a healthcare-associated infection, again, um, it's considered HAI if all of the infection of the infections specific criteria were not present during the POA definition time, pe time period, so not POA, but they were all present on or after the third calendar day of admission. Again, they have to occur within a time period that does not exceed a gap of a single day, calendar day, between any two adjacent elements. And um, we define a gap day as a ca calendar day during which none of the infection criteria are present. The transfer rule, as you all know, is if the patient meets the um, criteria on the day of transfer or the next day, we're going to attribute that back to the transfer transferring location that occurs after that time period, after the day of transfer or the next day, it's going to be attributable to the receiving um, facility. And, you know, this applies also to patients that are discharged. If they go home and then you find out the next day, they come back and you find out that they have, um, even if they don't come back, if you find out, uh, I, maybe you have communications with your medical office medical offices, but if you're aware of it, um, you're going to attribute that back to your facility if it occurs on the day of transfer the next day. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I said transfer, I meant discharge. Okay, warning. The next slide is very important. Does this work? All right, here's, a, here's an example, and I say it's really important because we actually get this question all the time. I know that people don't understand this um, as well as they should. So this is an example that is not present on admission. It is an HAI. Day one, the patient's admitted. They're asymptomatic. 
They have, however, a urine culture that's collected for 10,000 CFUs of E. coli in the urine, but they're asymptomatic, as I said, and there's no, sim there's no documentation in the two days prior that they were symptomatic either. Second day, they're asymptomatic. The third day, they run a fever. Um, and the fourth day, they have a f culture again, and they're now 100,000 colony forming units of E. coli in the urine. This meets the symptomatic UTI criteria. They didn't meet it in the POA. They had a positive culture, but they didn't have any symptoms. You left that catheter in, you know, for four days. Doesn't say they have one here, but you're only gonna report it if they did, probably, so. Um, so this is a UTI that's gotta be reported um, to your, for your facility, okay? This is one of those examples where it's neither POA nor NHAI, and you're not gonna report anything. Patient came in and they were asymptomatic. They had a fever on the second day. The third day, they're asymptomatic again. The next day, I don't know why, but they drew a culture on the patient. <laughs> it happens. Uh, and it's positive for 100,000 of E. coli, asymptomatic, asymptomatic, five and six. So, we didn't meet the criteria in the first two days, and we didn't meet them after that. We only had a positive culture on day three or later. Um, uh, day seven would be too long because there would be a gap day here, two, two gap days here. So this is one of those cases where they, they don't meet either criteria and it's not gonna be reported. Although you and I believe they have, may believe they have a UTI. Okay. Good news is we probably also would think that they probably came in with it. Okay, I've covered this, the gap day rule, or the gap day definition, so I'll give you an example of gap day again. Uh, patient is admitted on one, April 1st to the ICU. They put in the Foley. Um, six days later, they have a temp. Uh, on 4-8, they're asymptomatic. They're afebrile. This is a gap day. They don't have any suprapubic tenderness. They have no CVA pain. They have no fever. It's a gap day. Uh, the next day, they have a positive urine culture. So because there's a single gap day here, and the Foley's been in longer than two days, uh, this is gonna be a catheter-associated UTI. Again, a, if, if 4.9 had been asymptomatic, and 4.10 the urine culture had been collected, it would not be considered a, a UTI, because there have been two gap days. Okay. Our definition of um, indwelling catheter has not changed. Um, that's, that's good to hear, hey? So it's simply that a tube that's inserted into the urinary bladder through the urethra that's left in place and is connected to a collection system. It includes those patients that are getting irrigations. Those patients are probably at higher risk of UTIs. So we include those patients as well. Um, it doesn't include straight in and out catheters nor suprapubic catheters, nor nephrostomy tubes, but if a patient has suprapubic catheter or nephrostomy tubes, which happens sometimes, and a Foley, they are included in your catheter-associated UTI to, um, surveillance. If the Foley is there, they're included. Um, I got a question this week from somebody that uh, they had a patient, I think it was a spinal cord injury patient, that they were doing, he was doing intermittent self-caths, self and then at night the nursing staff was putting in a Foley catheter and they were taking it out every day. Is this something that you guys see? No? Okay, so she wanted to know if they were eligible for CAUTI, and my answer is yes, because the catheter was in place each day for, uh, indwelling catheter was in place at some point of each day. So on the third night, they've now become eligible for a CAUTI. So we get all sorts of crazy questions. Okay. And I think we've pretty much covered what is the definition of a, a catheter-associated UTI. So um, the only thing I want to highlight is it is the date of the event that you're looking at to determine whether or not the catheter had been in two days. Date of event, date of the last element used to meet the criteria. Discontinuation and reinsertion. We get this all the time. And as I said, we're coming out with, in the newsletter with... Um, guidance for this, but if the Foley catheter is discontinued and a full catheter day passes before a Foley is reinserted, then the day count for determining catheter-associated UTI begins anew. 
Otherwise, it continues from the previous catheter. So I have two examples. Patient has a Foley day three, day four. They took it out on day five. They put it back in on day six. And um, they, I'm sorry, they took it out. They took it out on April 2nd, and they put it back in on April 3rd. Um, this becomes day six. Continues from day five for Foley because uh, there was not a full calendar day um, without a Foley. As opposed to this example down here where they took the Foley out on April 2nd, there was no Foley for the whole day on April 3rd, and they replaced it on, day, on April 4th. This becomes new Foley day one, Foley day two, and Foley day three on April 6th. On this date, they're eligible for another CAUTI. Okay. Again, somewhat arbitrary, but just trying to make a rule so that we all do it all the same. <clears throat> we just pretty much covered this. The date of the event is the date of the last symptom. So if you have a temp on one day and the urine culture the next day, this is, you've now met criteria, this is your date of event. So quick examples of a device associated. Patient <clears throat> has a Foley inserted on day one. They're asymptomatic. They remain, the Foley remains in place on, and they spike a fever on day two. They still have a fever on day three. <clears throat> they have a positive urine culture on day four that meets criteria, E. coli. Um, <clears throat> because they didn't meet the criteria in the first two days, even though they had a fever here, this is a device associated, this is a cauti, okay? They have to, they would have had to have their, cat, their culture in the first two days for this to be a UTI, but not a catheter-associated UTI. Um, you're just gonna ignore this fever then and utilize day three or day, day four. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't wanna, I wanna correct that. You can, count, you can count the fever in here because what we tell you to do is to look at the date of event. So scratch what I just said because I don't want to confuse you. It's easy to do. It's easy, it's easy for me to get confused. So just look at your date of event. Your date of event is um, day four here. It's the date of the last element. Because that's, that date is not in the first two days of the catheter, this is considered a catheter-associated UTI. That's really the easiest way to do it, and it'll get you in the least amount of trouble. And I can get into trouble sometimes, in case you hadn't guessed that. <laughs> All right. This is not a CAUTI. Foley is inserted on day four. They have a temp of 100.6 the next day. They send the urine culture, and it's positive for 100,000. Um, they meet the SUTI criteria on this date, day five. But Foley hadn't been in place for greater than two calendar days on the date of the event here. It had only been in, it was on its second day. So this is not catheter-associated UTI. Okay. This is also not a catheter-associated UTI. Foley inserted on day four, removed, very symptomatic, four days later, Day eight, on day nine, there's still no Foley. They have a fever. And on day 10, they have a fever and they have candida. Um, the date of event on this, in this case is day 10. And it was not the day of removal nor the next day. It was after that. So it's not considered caudy. Last example, I think. Patient comes into the ICU, has fully put in on day four, removed on day eight, reinserted on day nine, and on day 10 they meet criteria. Um, this is one of those reinsertion ones. This is going to be considered a, a catheter associated. Oh, wait. This patient had a Foley in place for some part of each calendar day for greater than two days, and there was not a full calendar day without a Foley in place. So this is a CAUTI. Is that clear?
Location of attribution for CAUTI is the same as it was for LCBI. It's the location where the patient was assigned on the date of the UTI event. Um, and uh, again, the date of the last uh, element for the criteria, with the exception, only exception being the transfer rule, which I think we've pretty much covered. If it occurs on the day of transfer or discharge, or the next day, it goes back to the attributing location. I'm just going to go over one example here that we get a lot of questions about, and that's this multi transfer rule. So in this case, patient is in the ICU on day one of admit, and on day two, they're also in the ICU. On day three, they start in the ICU, then they go to 5 West, then they go to CCU. And the next day, they have um, an HAI, in this case, a UTI. This HAI is going to be attributable to the ICU since that was the first location the day before the event. So this is, you know, your transfer rule time period here, the day of transfer, the next day. Um, and so this, this is the ICU here. Trying to expand that incubation period is, you know, to the longest time we can in those two days. Okay. Oh, this came through all the press. I wanted to, this was supposed to come through in two different pieces. So we sent out an email to people and it said, it appears a user from your organization with username XXS is in the process of updating their SDN digital certificate. CDC is in the process of reviewing their status and will notify the user via email when the process is complete. At that time, the user will be able to log in. So we get an email back from this person that says, I've already installed it on two computers a couple of weeks ago. You better make sure it works right because it is a hassle to get this done. And I did it all myself and it worked fine. Please do not screw it up. <laughs> Apparently she's worked with us before. <clears throat> Aren't you glad those digital certificates are going away? Yeah. <laughs> Has anybody here been samified? Ah, okay. Do you like it? Yes. All right, cool. All right. Samified is the new system that you guys will all be moving over to. Instead of digital certificates, we give you these cool little bingo cards that uh, they'll have you put in codes for, um, and they're good forever, so you like this. Okay. <coughs> well, now, we're just going to very, very quickly, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on data entry. Um, I do just want to highlight three fields. Um, here on this section, the urinary catheter, we're going to ask you to identify whether or not there was a urinary catheter in place um, greater than two calendar days on the date of event, or if it had been removed but, but was in place for greater than two calendar days, um, or neither. There was no urinary catheter that was in place on the day of event or not in place greater than two days on the date of event, okay? This is gonna drive the system to identify this as either catheter associated or non-catheter associated. Um, the location for device insertion is optional. If you want it, sometimes we get questions from facilities that say, well, they put one in, they took it out, and then they put another one in, they're on different units, what do we put in? And we say, you can make your own determination, your own policy about what you wanna do with that because we don't utilize that field right now. So, um, you know, you get to make your decision. And the date of device insertion is also um, optional at this point. Um, I did get a question this week from somebody. It, it looks like um, the, on the form, I don't see it on here. Maybe it's on the screen. It actually says urinary catheter at time of specimen collection. And that's a, that's a, an error. We missed pulling that off when we changed the definition. So um, this is correct. And uh, it's been there for a year and a half and nobody noticed it until a user emailed me yesterday. So um, just, just know that it's at the date of event is what we're concerned about with the catheter presence, not the date of specimen collection. 
Okay, your summary data is collected um, pretty much the same way. It's, it's on the same forms as for LCBI. Again, you're gonna collect the number of patients that are present at the time of the count um, each day on the unit and, and enter that in this field here. And then the number of patients that have a urinary catheter that are there at that time on that unit and enter it here for each day. And then you'll sum the numbers at the bottom for, at the end of the month. For NICU, um, I do want to point out that there is no in-plan CAUTI surveillance for NICUs. We no longer allow that because they're just used so infrequently in that patient population. The data is not really that meaningful. But some facilities are um, opting to continue to do this off-plan. So if you're doing that, um, those will be entered here. URC days, and you'll be stratifying it by the different birth weights. Again. A birth weight, not weight at that time, but the weight of the baby at birth. Special care areas, there's no difference in how the data is collected here um, between a special care area and an ICU or a ward. Um, unlike, you know, CLABSIs, you have permanent or temporary central lines for LCBIs. It's, here it's just a urinary catheter. Um, and uh, it's entered, I do, again, for all of these events or all of these um, location types, you are going to have to tell us if you've had no events for these uh, this month, and that's where you're gonna check it here, CAUTI. Um, <clears throat> if you don't check that and you don't enter any CAUTI events, you'll get an alert and they'll say, you know, we don't know, do you really not have any UTIs or have you just forgotten to enter them? You'll also get an alert if you don't enter your patient days or your urinary catheter days um, for that month. And um, <clears throat> so this is the alert example of the alert. In plan denominators were reported for these locations with no associated event. So in this case, the ICU, they you entered summary data, you told us how many patient days you had and how many urinary tract days you had, but you didn't enter any CAUTIs and you didn't tell us that there were no events. So you can, handy dandy little thing here, you can just go down here and check these, if that's so. Smart person might wait and do that. I, probably not a good idea, but um, you could do that, so. Again, if you want to collect your data electronically, we're happy to have you do that. Um, we just ask that you concurrently collect your data manually. You go on the unit and, or have whoever does it on the unit collect it manually, do the patient count and the catheter day count at the same time each day, and um, collect it electronically. Also, compare those two for three months. As long as there's no difference more than 5% in either direction, you can then um, do that for that location, just use your electronic methods. Um, if there is a deviation of greater than 5%, then you gotta start all over again, try to figure out where the problem is, get it right until you, um, you know, make, make changes until you are able to get an accurate count electronically, and um, then you can move ahead with that. So you need to do it in each location for three months minimum. Just another sign. I do want to say that oncology hospitals have to report um, separately for all locations and units. Do we have anybody from oncology hospital here? Nobody. Okay. And to remind you that your um, CMS reportable data has to be included in your monthly reporting plans. If you don't put it in your monthly reporting plan, it will not be sent to CMS. Um, and you won't be happy. They won't be happy. Here's your resources. Um, this is the training site for urinary tract infection information. We have Lectora, um, which is a self-paced um, uh, software program and does have uh, self-testing. There's questions in there and you have to score greater than 80%. We do um, expect that people will do the training at least once uh, before they utilize the, the system. And then we have, uh, these webinars will be on there as people have told you in um, April. I believe, I hope this one is down now, I think it is, because it's, it's outdated. <clears throat> okay. 
These are just the forms that you'll use to report your data. And more um, resources for you. This is a, su a summary, a line listing of all of the training that's available that would be pertinent to you doing CAUTI training. Okay, so another funny email. So we sent this out, you know, we sent, this is what we call a blast email um, to everybody that's a participant. You know, we said, well, we'll be restarting the NHS and application in a few minutes. Please plan accordingly, you know, because if people have got data in there, we want them to save it so they don't, it doesn't get lost. And somebody reported back, I haven't started baking yet. I don't know if I'll get to it. Not sure what that meant, but. <laughs> I don't know if she was referring to like baking the data, you know, like she didn't get it in, or if she was, thought she was talking to somebody else, or what, but we weren't really sure how to respond, so. <laughs> okay, so we have um, finished about 15 minutes early, and I'm going to look to Courtney to see before we get into the case studies. Do you want to take a break now, or do you want me to start for 15 minutes? What's that? I'm sorry? Keep going? For 15 minutes? OK, we'll keep going for 15 minutes. Um, I can, but I would rather wait, because we might cover the, the questions in the... I, you're going to be extra special. You're the only person that's going to get to answer, ask a question. How do you like that? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Page 23. Okay. Gap day, page 23. Oh, my page is different. You, you know, my page is different than your page. I'm trying to resolve your three-day Foley rule plus the gap day example of symptomatology. So you said that you have to have the Foley in for three days by the last day of symptomatology. So in your gap day example, if you have your temperature on 4-7, like Monday, whatever, and then you have a gap day, day two, and then you have a culture on day three, Wednesday. You're saying that if the Foley was inserted on Monday. Is it this one? Oops. Um, this would count. Now I've done it. <laughs> How do I get it over? On the same day that they had the first element like or order. some of. Thank you. Is it this one? Yes. Okay. So so if if instead of the foley being placed on 41, yes, the foley was placed on 47. Okay. Because I'm trying to determine if the foley has to be in place for 3 days on the first day of symptoms or on the last day and you just said the last day. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that means in this example, the foley can be placed on 47, the day of the temperature. And then there's a gap day and then the day of the urine is the third day. That's three or more days. That is correct. So this would be counted as a cowdy, mm -hmm. fully placed on the day of the first symptom. That, that makes no sense. Well, hopefully if the patient has a fever, they're going to be looking to find out why the patient has a fever. Okay. Correct, but they place the fully on the same day, so it, it shouldn't be related to that. And clinically, I'm going to agree with you. And, and the hope is that most of the time, they, if they have a fever, they're probably going to try to figure out why they have the fever, um, and they're going to collect that culture sometime sooner. There will be rare instances. We, we can sit here and try to come up with situations that don't work, and, they do, and those situations do happen rarely. Okay? This is not an uncommon situation where they place a Foley because a patient is having problems, not having problems due to having the presence of a device. Okay. It's a surveillance definition, 
And we have, we made these rules because you asked for, people asked for them, users asked for them, because before we had no minimum time period, right? So in that case, it still would have been a CAUTI. Without the ability to have some clinical correlation, we can't use these numbers to be able to drive performance improvement. I'll just I understand. Okay. I understand. Okay, so let's, we'll, We'll keep going. No, I don't think so. Well, no, I think that's it. Okay, let's, let's start with our case study. Oh. So actually, we'll start, we'll, uh, so before we, before we start the case studies, I wanted to share something that, uh, on the web that highlights uh, the importance of making good methodology when performing HAI surveillance. So here we go. Okay. Oops. That's right. It's not right, is it? Here. Here. Okay. Hi, I'm Joan Snow, and my CEO says I should talk to you because your hospital has had zero healthcare associated infections for three years. Yes. As the infection preventionist, I can say that's true. Wow. That's amazing. I mean, I have my organization strive towards zero infections. And we have had some runs where we had a month here or there where we have had none but zero for three years. That's incredible. Yes. We did it. I have zero infections for three years. How? I mean, don't you ever have bacterial translocation where the patient has no infection, but the pathogen escapes the GI tract and appears in a blood culture? We have those cases, but my ID doctor throws those out. Yo, ID doctor? What is he doing surveillance for? He always does surveillance after I find the cases that meet the definition. Has. He done any online training on how to use the definitions or done any SU trainings on the NHS and definition or gone to a SHA training? No, he is an ID doctor. So, despite the fact that you have cases that meet the NHS and CLAPSI definition, you don't count them because your ID physician, who has no training on epidemiologic definitions or NHS and training, doesn't think they are NHS and cases? Yes. He is an ID doctor. How? Does he say they don't meet the NHS and CLAPSI definition? He is an ID doctor. You already said they met the definition. Why even have him look at them? He is an ID doctor. We established that. Have you been to training on the NHS and definition? Yes. I have done many classes and do the EGIP training on the definitions. So, you are having someone who is incompetent at using the definition override. Your judgment as a trained epidemiologist. He is an ID doctor. Yes. And if I had a central line infection, I would want him to give advice on how to manage that infection. Why does he even want to look at the CLAPSI cases? He is very interested in CLAPSI. As chair of the infection control, Committee, he gets a bonus for lowering the hospital's infections. Don't. You see that as a conflict of interest. Why would you allow the surveillance to potentially be compromised like that? He is an ID doctor. Let's talk about Caddy. No Caddy. We have zero H is. My ID doctor reviews them. Is your ID doctor's name Dr. No? Let's talk about SSISS. No small bowel infections. 
No colon surgery infections? I have had no HIS for three years. How? Do you do surveillance for SSISS? I look at the microbiology results and if there are none they are cleared. What? About radiology results? I look at the microbiology results and if there are none they are cleared. Why? Would a surgeon culture a gut leak? They use the x-rays to find abscesses and then treat. How about MD notes? Do you read them on the cases? Doctors at my hospital write a lot. Yes. How do you assure yourself they aren't diagnosing a surgical site infection in their notes or describing a wound infection if you don't read the notes? Doctors at my hospital write a lot. Do you do a search for antibiotic therapy post-surgery? Or returns to the O.R.? I have had no H.I.S.S. for three years. I? We take that as a no. So you never had a failed anastomosis that resulted in an infection? We have those cases, but my ID doctor throws those out. Doesn't he know that the definition does not exclude them from being cases? Yes, but he disagrees with the definition. I? can disagree with gravity, but it doesn't mean that it no longer applies to me. He is an ID doctor. I have had no H.I. is for three years. Liar. Ooh, I feel an H.I. coming on. I also have 100% hand hygiene compliance. Do you want to know how? All right. <laughs> so, oh, I, I don't think I want to take comments after that. No, let's, let's. Oh, the author's here? Oh. Oh, bravo, bravo. Who, who is the author? Greg Myers, Greg Myers? okay, nice job. <laughs> so that was just a little lighthearted. Uh, I thought you guys would enjoy that, I enjoyed it. Somebody sent it to me that, uh, um, and um, you know, I think it's really, it does drive home, you know, that we all need to do what we're supposed to do, and I understand that there are, the, the, the definitions are not perfect, believe me, we get in emails all the time and we understand it, and we are, I hope that you heard in the last two days that we do listen to you, and that we are trying to improve them, um, you know, where we can, so, um, we can do, we can go ahead and start one case study and uh, we're gonna just look at these. Um, we're not gonna get into surveillance versus clinical. We're just gonna learn, make sure that we're accurately reporting the definitions or applying the definitions and we'll try to optimize the consistency in that, that application and improve data quality. So as I said yesterday, when you're looking through these case studies, look at them, it, you, you might wanna consider looking at them in this order. Is it a POA? If it's a POA, and they haven't been discharged in the last two days, you can stop if um, we don't need it, have it, have it reported to NHSN. We're only interested in HAIs. Is it an HAI if it's not POA? If it's not an HAI, remember we talked about there's some that are not POA, that are not HAI, then stop. Finally, uh, next you're gonna ask yourself, is it catheter-associated UTI? And then um, you're gonna need to look at where to attribute it if it is a, an, uh, a CAUTI. So case one, um, Mama Unlucky is admitted unconscious after she fell when three deer ran out in front of her while skiing. She has a broken femur, a Foley, and a peripheral IV are inserted. On day three, her Foley is removed. She's awake and making good recovery progress. On the fourth day, she's up with assistance, but she complains of pain on voiding, has a UA collected, and it has slight leukocyte esterase, negative nitrites, and 15 WBCs on spun urine. 
The next day, they collect a urine culture which has 10 to the fourth, uh, or 10,000 CFUs per ml of E. coli. So, questions for you is, does this patient have a caudi, and if so, what type? You can choose yes, a SUDI 1A, yes, a SUDI 2A, yes, an abuti, or no caudi at all. You can vote. Couple more seconds. Okay, so let's see what you all say. Oh, we have some difference of agree of opinions here. We have 50% uh, say it's a caudi 2A, and some people, 38%, say no caudi. This is no caudi. Okay, so criteria were not met in the POA time period, and the patient does not meet criteria for UTI with dysuria and positive urine culture and a UA. I'm sorry, they do meet that, but the date of event was later than the day after removal, right? So the Foley was removed on day three. The patient didn't meet criteria, the date of event, on day, until day five. Okay, so it's a UTI, but it's not a catheter-associated UTI. Okay. <laughs> 